Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, one God. Amen. Uh, welcome to this live stream uh, provided by Coptic Orthodox Answers. I feel myself very privileged uh, to be invited to take place in this uh, wonderful ministry that has uh, helped so people uh, to deepen their faith and to understand uh, our Orthodox tradition so much more deeply and richly. And I feel myself unworthy uh, to offer any reflections in the midst of uh, those who regularly uh, offer material here. But in this uh, unusual Palm Sunday, I have been asked to speak, and uh, I will speak for a while about the subject of isolation. Is it an opportunity or is it an obstacle? And there will be uh, adequate time for questions at the end of this presentation. And I have been asked uh, speak to those of you who are listening and watching and suggest that you save your questions until the end of my uh, reflections, which will take about half an hour. And then you post them in the chat against this live stream so that they appear all together uh, when we come to think about questions. Uh, otherwise, we have to try and search for your questions uh, against the whole length uh, of the stream. So uh, I'm waiting just a moment or two to allow uh, other people, other participants and viewers to join the stream. But I will begin again now in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. God bless you all on this unusual and unexpected celebration of Palm Sunday in a year that has been full of surprises and complications for us all. It is in the times when things don't turn out as we expect that we are often most receptive to God. We should consider this as an opportunity to deepen our personal and transforming experience of God and not see it as an obstacle to spiritual and personal growth. I could talk about the practical opportunities we might have in this time to learn a musical instrument or to read some of the classical literature that we've put off because we are usually too busy. Perhaps it's a time to tidy the house or empty the garage. There are lots of possibilities for positive activity. But I am more concerned in this brief reflection to speak about the opportunity to reorient our lives and build a spiritual foundation that will have value after this time of isolation is completed. And I want to speak about the obstacles that we can put in place and have already well established in our lives, which prevent us making the most of this opportunity. I always like to be sure that I understand what the terms are that we are using. It's easy to confuse ourselves. And the subject I have been given is isolation. What does this word mean and where does it come from? It surely has a sense of being separated from people. In fact, the word comes from the Latin language originally, from the word insulatus, and it had the meaning of being made into an island. This is a wonderfully descriptive etymology. When we are forced to be isolated from others, especially in this time, it is as if we are being made into little islands, separated from each other, still visible on the horizon, but not quite connected. The question we want to consider is whether there is something good and even necessary in this experience, even when it is forced upon us. But we also want to be aware of the harmful possibilities in being isolated from others, while we also find fruitfulness and positive outcomes in becoming an island dweller for a while. A recent survey in the UK found that as much as 10% of the population often felt lonely. Among the elderly, this rose to 50%. And among young people, and especially teenagers, this was as high as a disturbing 80%. No wonder so many young people, and others, will turn to a wide variety of means to avoid these harmful emotions. And they are harmful, leading to increased suicide rates and a 25% increase in mortality. Such feelings of loneliness are not only felt by those who are physically alone, 
but are experienced painfully by those who are often surrounded by crowds, but have no real interior connection with other people. It is felt by those of us even who are committed Christians and who find ourselves standing with hundreds of others in worship each week, but don't feel connected to anyone else. It is felt by those of us who find the value and meaning in our lives only in other people and in our work and studies. Being isolated in this present time and finding these things taken away can make these feelings even more overwhelming so that we turn this way and that way to try and cope with the difficult thoughts and emotions. When we feel isolated in this negative way, it can have a damaging effect on our physical, mental and spiritual health. It can cause depression, low self-esteem and anxiety, and it can lead us to fall away from our relationship with God as if he has caused all of these negative thoughts and feelings even as if they are a punishment in some way. Our orthodox spirituality has something to offer those of us who feel lonely, detached, without purpose and uncomfortable, as we have to struggle with isolation at this time. These are not feelings and experiences we need to be bound by throughout our life. It is not so much that we are physically separated from others and our usual activities, Rather, it is that this situation brings into sharp focus our lack of a source of value, meaning, purpose and relationship apart from them. God is asking and inviting us to take the opportunity to discover a lasting value and meaning in our life that cannot be shaken by circumstances and only comes alive in union with him. All the while we hold on to other things, as if they were the most important things, as if they really gave ultimate and lasting meaning and value to our lives, we will discover that they are an obstacle to us, becoming the person we were truly and uniquely created to be. And all the while we turn away from the opportunity to become the person God made us to be, in union with him, we will suffer the pain and distress of never quite being comfortable with who we are, always feeling that something is missing, always afraid that our value and purpose will be taken away from us. This time of isolation shows us that we have a need within us and it gives us an opportunity to fill it. But all the while we try to address it in the wrong way, we will make things worse and we will create a lasting obstacle to discovering our own identity in God. It is only as we come to experience a more and increasingly complete union with God that we discover that we are never truly alone and no longer have to be overwhelmed with feelings of loneliness or a lack of value and purpose when we are in a condition of isolation such as we experience now. While we hold on to people and relationships and activities as if they defined us and made us, we will discover that they are an obstacle to becoming who we truly are. When we begin to discover this opportunity to hold on to God and discover that God is already holding on to us, every other relationship finds its right place and can become fruitful to us. The Lord Jesus, one who certainly enjoyed the company of his disciples, often went away from them and from the crowds to be alone. But it was to be alone with God. When we read in the Gospels that John the Baptist had been killed, we find when Jesus heard this, he withdrew from there in a boat to a deserted place by himself. And after he had performed the miracle of the feeding of the 5,000, we read, and after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up the mountain by himself to pray. And when evening came, he was there alone. And when he spoke to the disciples about the time of his death, he said, the hour is coming. Indeed, it has come when you will be scattered each to his own home and you will leave me alone. Yet I am not alone 
because the Father is with me. The Lord Jesus was truly man while remaining God. He felt hunger and tiredness. He experienced the same necessary benefit of relationships with others and of spending time apart from others. But when he was alone, when he was isolated, he was in fact never alone. The Father was with him and he was with the Father. What is the opportunity that we have in a time of isolation? It is the opportunity to reorient our lives so that we also experience God as the ever-present basis for all of our experience and for all of our relationships. And what is the obstacle to this experience? It is surely that we don't see how to overcome our brokenness or our dependence on relationships and activities, which mask and soothe that void which is within us and which only God can fill. It is that we keep on trying to cope as best we can in the same way without ever discovering God is with us and waiting for us and always calling us. In a time of isolation, we can easily find ourselves turning even more addictively to social media, to the TV, to Netflix, to anything that gives us a sense of being connected, even, it is, even if it is a pseudo-connection, a false connection with others. We can find ourselves turning to sin and damaging habits to try to cope with the sense that we are detached from everything and everyone that gives our life value and meaning. We are surely made to be in connection with others, to be in relationship with others, to be active in our lives. But when this becomes an aching need inside of us, then we need to realize that the problem is deep within us and not actually in our relationships and activity at all. If we become truly human in the experience of an increasing union with God, and if this is what establishes our true human personhood, then we need to develop our relationship of intimacy with God and seek the fruit of the Holy Spirit during this time of isolation from others and before all other things. The experience of true intimacy with God is what makes possible authentic intimacy with others, relating to them as human persons themselves and not simply objects of our own needs. And this relationship of intimacy with God through union with him becomes the foundation for discovering our own true value and it provides the lasting meaning for our life. To become truly human in this way does not mean that we have no emotions or that we no longer have any physical needs, but it does mean that an increasing balance brought about by union with God leads to an increasing emotional balance and a reorientation of our thoughts and desires. We should not imagine <coughs> that what is required of us is a greater religiosity, as if this is what union with God represents. We need to become spiritual men and women if we hope to encounter God and participate in his divine life. We are not asked to become more religious if that means people who only follow an external rule of religious practice. We are not asked to become overcome with guilt and despair as if having tried to be such a person, we have somehow failed and do not deserve intimacy with God or others. Nor should we make God the solution of our emotional needs, as if he was himself to become the object of romantic and other feelings. God does not intend to become our best friend in any human sense, or even worse, some sort of boyfriend though we do experience a rich and deep and profound divine friendship with God. The relationship with God and the experience of intimacy such union with him makes possible, while spiritual, is entirely real, and it begins to transform rather than eliminate our physical and emotional conditions and states. I was watching a video of a brief interview with one of the hermit fathers who had lived from the beginning with Abuna Mata el Meskin. 
He lives alone in the desert most of the time, and he was asked what he had learned there. And he said, we find in the desert the first love, the sincere love of Christ. We experience a personal friendship and intimacy with the person of the Lord Jesus. This inner feeling is very real, a very intimate life with the Lord always saying, I am with you. This is certainly the experience that the Lord desires for us all. It changes everything, especially when we are isolated from friends and family and our usual activity. But how do we begin to experience this? The fathers teach us that at the beginning of making any progress in the spiritual way, we must abandon the reliance on our own strength and our own understanding since this has led us to the confused and dysfunctional state in which we find ourselves. We have already tried to find the path of satisfaction of our needs, and we have discovered that whatever temporary success we seem to have obtained, in the long term, we remain anxious about many things, and these become present especially in our isolation. Even in the moments when we are busy with others, we are still concerned about how others think of us and how we need to act around others. So the first step is to determine that we will try less to manage things ourselves and will begin to seek the indwelling grace of the Holy Spirit. We begin by praying, Lord, I have tried to work out your purposes in my life in my own strength and with my own understanding. Now I ask that you will work out your purposes for me and give me the grace to serve your will and become the unique person you have created me to be. Who is this God with whom we seek intimacy? It is the good God, the source of goodness and love, who has created all mankind for this purpose and has called us uniquely into being for a relationship of intimacy that cannot be satisfied with anything else. He is not a God who threatens to punish us if we do not offer the correct words at the correct time, nor is he a God with whom we can bargain so that we can offer a certain amount of prayer and he promises to reward us with gifts of one kind or another. He is a loving God who has called us into being so that we might participate in the gift of himself, of his own life and love, and he asks no more than that we desire this true and abundant life of union with him. The experience of intimacy with God is already the reward for those who seek him, and no other reward is needed or can satisfy. And this can be an opportunity we lay hold of in this present time, if we desire it with our whole heart. Much of our own inner turmoil and distress is caused by the fact that we have not sought God in this way. And we have struggled through all of our life trying to cope in our own strength. Now that we are forced to be alone, now that everything ordinary has come to a halt, we see that we have not chosen and desired that intimacy with God, which we need above all when we are separated from everything and everyone else. All of the initiative, all of the desire for intimacy, the gracious invitation comes from the side of God already. This is not something we can demand of God or need to organize for ourselves, but our very existence as a unique creation is already the sign that God desires this intimacy with us and for us. When we have tried to take control ourselves, and have engaged in simple religious activities, hoping that this would cause God to reveal himself to us. We have discovered that acting in our own strength and according to our own understanding does not lead to union with God. It cannot, because it represents a false idea of what God is like altogether. Many of us have never allowed ourselves the stillness which would reveal to us the gentle touch and the calming voice of the Lord. But this is entirely what is required of us. Not so much that we do more, but in a sense that we do less. We have an opportunity to do just that in this present time. 
Stillness matters in the seeking after union and intimacy with God, because God reveals himself in stillness and silence, in the still small voice and the sound of a light breeze. When we are immersed in the exterior noise around us and allow this exterior noise to overwhelm the interior place of the heart, when we are filled with distractions, then we cannot hear the voice of God, especially when we are trying to bring about the experience of God or the satisfaction of our needs in our own strength. But the distractions have been removed to a great extent in the present time and circumstances. The Orthodox spiritual tradition offers us an experience, an opportunity to encounter God more deeply in intimacy, which is what we need, all of us, more than anything else. If we have an exterior silence in these present times, and we can find one more easily perhaps at the moment, and we are seeking an encounter with God, then the words and prayers and psalms of the Agbeya gain a greater and transforming power. We discover also that in the quietness of an exterior silence, we are able to begin to pray them with attention. If we really want to meet God, and this is what true prayer, the authentic encounter with God requires, God is not pleased by the hurried completion of a rule of prayer. It is much better if we want to have the possibility of experiencing God himself, that we pray less, but with as much attention and warmth as possible. If we have an exterior silence and we are seeking God, then this is the time to turn to the scriptures with whatever reading plan we have at hand. We are not trying to read as much of the Bible as quickly as possible, but we will want to make use of this time of isolation so that our heart and attention can settle into the words we are reading. These also must become an experience and expression of prayer so that we are reading in the presence of God and expect him to quicken some phrase or sentence, especially to us, to bring it alive so that it becomes his speaking to us. This communication from God, hearing the light breeze of his voice, is an experience of this divine intimacy we have the opportunity of experiencing. We should read a small portion of the gospel, the gospel set for the day, for instance, and also read it in a prayerful manner. What are we trying to achieve? It is not an emotion, but a spiritual experience of God that changes everything. And so we prayerfully reflect on the small number of words we are considering from the scriptures. And we ask in prayer, my Lord, speak to me, illuminate me, grant me a word from yourself for my healing and salvation. And we find that a phrase or a sentence comes alive to us. But we must not immediately close the scriptures and get on with our daily life as if it means nothing. If we have asked God to speak to us and some aspect of the scripture comes alive to us, then we have to respond. This is the word of God to us. This is a beginning of our relationship with him, of our intimacy with him. At the least, we must thank God for speaking. We must let it make a difference. This is one of the early keys to developing a closer and more intimate life with God so that everything changes. We must make use of what we receive from God. And this is no more than we learn in the parable of the talents. Every small encounter with God, every sense of closeness, of intimacy, must be acknowledged and must make a difference. We discover an opportunity in our use of the Agbeya and the reading of the scripture when we abandon all haste and hurry, when we do not have a target that we are trying to achieve as quickly as possible, and when all of our attention finds a stillness and a centeredness in the words which we are using and studying and bringing within the heart and not leaving only to occupy the mind. There should be no urgency. 
It is the encounter with God which matters, even if our words are few indeed. And that passage of scripture we reflect on in God's presence is perhaps very short. The Orthodox Church especially values the use of a short prayer, such as the Jesus prayer. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me. We do not use this as a mantra, but each time we repeat it slowly and prayerfully, we intend it as a prayer of the heart filled with attention and warmth. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me. It is often very useful to have a prayer rope or a string of beads so that we do pray this prayer for a particular amount of time. Not that the number matters so much, but because we are easily distracted. Having a prayer rope provides a physical activity for our hands to be occupied with. And the simple words occupy our mind with the intention that the heart is turned in prayer towards God and that this is fulfilled in the increasing experience of the presence of God with us. We must ask God to speak to us and reveal himself to us in his own way and in his time without demanding or expecting how this might express itself. This requires an increasing degree of reflection and interior stillness. How can we become aware of God if we drown out his presence in our lives with so much noise and activity? We must begin to sit quietly as we have already described and rather than trying to pray a great deal in many words as if this must please God, we should sit and gently pray the Jesus prayer even in the form which we find it in the Tazbihah. My Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, help me. We wait for a spiritual response. We do not expect more, but we prevail in this quiet prayer until we sense that our prayer is heard, whatever our feelings. This encounter with God in isolation, in silence, is an opportunity to bring about a spiritual stillness and an intimate experience of God, however fragmentary, that begins to affect our daily life. We become quieter people with an interior stillness, a spiritual stillness that we bring into all of our activities and conversations and that we can take with us back into our normal activities after this period of isolation is completed. This requires the effort from us to make use of this opportunity so that this divine stillness can take root and bear fruit. Be still and know that I am God. Everything in our modern world resists this stillness. But if we are willing to make the effort, if we will use this opportunity found in isolation to discipline ourselves and change the circumstances of our lives, even for a short time each day, then we will encounter God as he promises. This is the opportunity to discover God when we turn inwards in isolation. But there is also the opportunity to discover God with us as we turn outwards. When we are always expecting and hoping for something else, then it is difficult to participate in the relationships and the activities that are open to us in the love of God. Part of our anxiety is created by expecting something else all the time. When we have already decided what life looks like, for good or bad, we are often liable to miss the opportunity to experience life with God when it is offered. What would happen if we expected less but experienced more? Too often we expect so much or we expect things that are not real in themselves at all. And then we become disappointed that we do not experience what we have constructed in our mind and emotions. This can prevent us actually seeing what is already offered to us from others and from God. It is as if we planted a seed, but were always expecting a flourishing plant to appear all at once so that we ignore the little shoots of growth that need preservation and nourishment. And after much disappointment, we walk away from the garden, sure that nothing could ever appear just as we expected. In relation to our experience of God, 
we need to seek and expect small signs of his presence with us to begin with. We have not yet grown in our ability to participate in the divine life in a mature way. When we are learning to walk, we should not be discouraged that we cannot run. And in the same way, in our experience with God, we should look for the signs of our beginning to experience his presence rather than be dismayed that we have not received all that we imagine or have seen in the experience of others. We need to take each day at a time. We need to wait and persevere to hear and see what God is doing in our life today and what experience of God is offered to us today. We need to take every opportunity to live every moment with God. This gives our whole life meaning and value. Every conversation, every interaction, every service can be transformed when freely experienced with God. We must look for these opportunities to serve others, even in our isolation, not to satisfy our hungry need for relationship and for value and meaning, but so that we freely give ourselves in service without thinking about ourselves at all, just as we are discovering that God gives himself entirely and wonderfully freely to us. When we live a day at a time with God, when we take the opportunity <clears throat> that this time of isolation gives us to reorient ourselves towards God, and to seek the relationship of union with God that gives everything meaning, then every day is filled with opportunities to grow closer to God and to experience his life and love more completely. There is peace and joy, hope and patience, faith and love in the increasing experience of life with God. It drives away from us all those feelings of inadequacy and anxiety and the lack of worth and meaning, which are often hidden away and only come to the surface in a time of isolation, or perhaps which we are trying to cope with every day. But God is waiting for us, calling us, inviting us to take the opportunity to enter into a closer and more transforming union with him. And in a time of isolation, this is the opportunity we have presented to us. The obstacles are within us, our continuing insistence on sorting things out ourselves or filling our lives with less than God, with less than the true and authentic and abundant life he offers us. But in the isolation which is forced upon us now, there is a possibility for us if we turn to God with warmth and attention making use of the stillness and the quiet in various ways, participating in the orthodox spiritual tradition, so that we become that person God has uniquely made us to be, not the person we try to be for others, to discover that eternal value he has given us, not the value found in Facebook likes, and to find that lasting purpose for our life, in union with him in every moment, which no one can ever take away. This is our opportunity, and God gives it to us in this time of isolation that comes unasked for and unexpectedly. May this be our experience, for his glory and for our salvation. Amen. Thank you for listening. Uh, if you have some questions, then post them and uh, I'll see if I can respond in a helpful way. Uh, I, I grew up in an evangelical Protestant uh, family and I spent three years training to be an evangelical pastor and missionary. Uh, so I am familiar with a wide variety of forms of evangelism. Uh, my personal view is that at the moment, in the present times, the best means of evangelism is to make possible opportunities for people to learn about our life and our spirituality uh, in as easy a way as possible. Uh, 
And so I'm very much in favor, not so much uh, of standing on the street corner and preaching. I've done that in the past as an evangelical, but rather making sure that we have the highest quality printed and uh, multimedia resources available so that people are able to take something away, study it at their own pace, uh, and easily find a way of asking questions about what they read. Uh, I feel I feel fairly confidently that people today are surrounded by so many uh, advertising different ideas, uh, different products, different experiences, that when we stand on the street corner, the unique message we have of our Orthodox gospel can be lost. But when we produce something of high quality, and when we try to engage with people, especially those around our churches, in a much more personal way, then I feel that we have the opportunity to help them to become catechumens, those who are gaining an understanding of our Orthodox faith. I'm not convinced that people are easily uh, converted by just hearing a few minutes uh, of preaching. So my own personal view is uh, that it would probably be more profitable to have a stall in a shopping mall where very high quality books and DVDs uh, were being given away and where people could ask questions if they want to. Um, another question. Is the coronavirus the wrath of God or do we just not know? Uh, I have, if you look on my Facebook uh, account, Father uh, Abuna Peter Farrington, you'll see I, I published um, quite a detailed presentation on this subject. And some of the fathers who run Coptic Orthodox Answers have also provided material about this. I don't believe this is the wrath of God at all, not for a moment. Uh, there are so many illnesses around the world that we have to understand these are not sent by God to punish people. These are consequences of humanity's fall into sinfulness. They are a sign of the brokenness of our creation. And we should not be asking who is God punishing. We should be asking, what should I do in service to others? Uh, again, this is an opportunity for us to manifest the love of God towards all mankind rather than judgmentally uh, to suggest that there are particular people that God is punishing. Uh, if you listen to my lengthy presentation, you'll see that um, I don't believe that we worship such a God who punishes people. Uh, I believe that we have a loving Heavenly Father who chastises those, uh, who seeks to lead all people to faith in him, and he will certainly use all the circumstances of our life. But I do not believe at all in a wrathful God who punishes people. Uh, the God that I worship is the one who was nailed to the cross by his own creation and hanging there in agony. He doesn't destroy those who are harming him in this way, but he says, Father, forgive them. And it's that message of love I find always from God, uh, a love which is for all those men and women, boys and girls he has created. Um, how can we be sure this isn't God's wrath? Because we read the Bible and we listen to the fathers of the church. And the Bible doesn't teach us that God shows wrath towards mankind. It was while we were sinners, the Bible clearly says to us. It was while we were sinners that Christ Jesus came into the world. And it was because God loved the world so much, he sent his only begotten son. Uh, and it was while they were nailing him to the cross that he said, Father, forgive them. So I'm very certain that this is not the wrath of God. Um, I feel disconnected to God. What should I do? Uh, if we are disconnected from God, we have to view it in the same way as any person. Uh, if I am disconnected from my wife, I have to put some effort into my relationship with her. If I'm disconnected from one of my children, I have to put effort into my relationship uh, with them. Uh, as a priest uh, here in isolation, uh, away from my own spiritual children, I have to put effort into my relationship with those who are in my care. I have to make sure that I'm mes messaging them regularly. I have to pray for them regularly. So if we feel disconnected from God, what should we do? We should do these things I've spoken about in this presentation. We should make time for our relationship with God and we should give ourselves to quietness and stillness. We should read the Bible and pray with as much warmth and attention as possible uh, until we begin 
to have a sense of God's presence with us. And we should never pray a small amount of prayers in the morning as if that was going to keep God off our back. If we want a relationship with someone, we have to spend time with them. If we want a relationship with God, it has to be the most important relationship in our life. And so when we feel disconnected, it's because we are disconnected. And it's not because God has disconnected himself from us. It's because we are not making any effort to connect ourselves with him. So take up your Agbeya and pray the evening hour of the Agbeya this evening. Uh, don't rush through it. Try and make every word of the evening hour your own. Pray the Lord's Prayer, our Father, as carefully as possible so that it's coming from your heart and not just from your head. And slowly you will find that you begin again to build a relationship with God. Uh, everyone is asking about coronavirus and China. Uh, again, that's something for politicians to discover afterwards. What we need to ask ourselves is, what am I supposed to do? How am I supposed to share the love of God uh, in this difficult situation? We shouldn't worry too much about the news. I would recommend that we get the news headlines once a day. And other than that, we should not spend a lot of time on news websites or on Facebook. Uh, there's a great many people who need our care and our kindness, and we should be seeking to support them rather than filling our time with stuff that isn't profitable to us. What is the Coptic Orthodox view of salvation? Does it occur in baptism or is it a process? Uh, salvation is the experience of becoming that person God made us to be. Uh, salvation is not a one moment matter. Uh, salvation is not something only experienced in baptism. Uh, salvation is the experience of growing closer and closer to God throughout our whole life so that we become more and more filled with the Holy Spirit and so that we become more and more transparent to the activity of God in the world. When I look at Pope St. Kirillos, I don't see a man who used many, many words to talk about God, but I see a man who, whenever someone met him, discovered in a way they were encountering God through Pope St. Kirillos. And that's the sort of person I want to be. That is what salvation means growing so united to God that God's life is my life in a way uh, and discovering that I become the person God made me to be not when I become religious and, and go to church a lot and pray from the egg bear a lot these are necessary tools for us but that isn't what makes me a spiritual man filled with the Holy Spirit it is becoming united with God every moment of every day in my experience and everything that doesn't belong to this life God has given me is an obstacle and I need to remove it. Uh, and as I grow closer to God, I become more saved. Uh, we, we say often when we're thinking about salvation, uh, I have been saved. I am being saved and I will be saved. Uh, there is a time when we encounter God. Uh, and even if we've been baptized within an Orthodox family as a child, we have to encounter God again. We cannot rely on the fact we were baptized as a child. We have to ask every day as we grow into maturity, have I encountered God today? Have I been converted again today? Have I turned my heart and my mind and my life back towards God today? And so, yes, we believe something happens in baptism. We believe that we enter into a new type of relationship with God. We believe that something happens to us because of God's activity. But even before baptism, a person has to have faith in God and be growing towards God. Those of us uh, who became Orthodox in our life, uh, there was no time in my life when I was not a Christian. Uh, even when I was a small child, I absolutely believed in God and in Jesus Christ, and I was a Christian. Uh, but slowly, as I grew into young adulthood, I became closer to God, and things had to change in my life so that I became more united with God. But when I was baptized into the Orthodox Church, uh, something very significant happened. It was as if I'd gone up a whole gear in my car or a whole division in a football team, not, not because of my own value, but there was a step change. Something happened when I was baptized. But I can't rely on that. 
Every day I have to grow closer to God. Every moment, I believe, God gives us an opportunity in this moment, in this conversation, in this decision I'm making, facing this temptation, in every moment, will I grow closer to God and experience more of salvation? Or will I grow further away from God and lose that experience of salvation? So baptism is absolutely fundamental to our own spiritual growth. But it requires every day that we are also converted and it requires every moment that we are working with all of our energy, uh, with all the grace that God has given us to grow into this intimate union with God. Uh, I don't believe that those who are not baptized will not go to be with God in whatever blessed place he provides. Uh, we do not believe in a God who says of a man who was about to be baptized and is run over by a bus as he's crossing the church to be baptized. What a shame. Uh, you were just five seconds too late to go to heaven. We don't believe that. And in fact, when someone comes to our Coptic Orthodox Church and says, I wish to begin to be prepared for baptism, we pray over them and we anoint them and we say that they already have faith because they do have faith. They have faith before they are baptized. Otherwise, they wouldn't be baptized. How can you baptize someone who has no faith? And so even those who are not yet baptized have faith in Christ. And in a way, they belong to the church also. But for us, if we have been baptized, we have no excuse. How am I distanced from God? If I've been baptized so that I have God's life in me, if I receive communion regularly so that I have God's life in me, how can I say I'm distant from God? It's because of something I'm doing. It's because of attitudes I have. It's because of habitual sin I'm allow allowing to carry on in my life. Because it's not God withdrawing himself from us. It's always me withdrawing myself from God. Uh, and so every day, if we want to talk about salvation, we can remember back to our baptism when we were saved in one sense. But we have to ask today, am I being saved today? Am I growing closer to God today? And we look forward to the time when in God's will and in his mercy, he will completely save us and give us a new body and a new experience that we cannot even imagine of life with him together. Uh, the Eastern Orthodox believe in the unity of Christ and we both believe in the hypostatic union. Uh, my, my views are, are very clear. I've spent half of my life studying uh, the theology around what we believe about Christ. Uh, I am reasonably expert on this. Uh, and if you go to my website, www.stgeorgeministry.com, uh, you will see many um, articles and papers about what we think about Jesus Christ. And uh, I have a book available called Orthodox Christology. It's, it's what I study all of the time. Uh, I believe that we have the same faith as the Eastern Orthodox Church. Um, I believe that we sometimes use different words, but we mean the same things. And already in the 1990s, uh, our bishops and Pope Shenouda uh, wrote an agreement with the Eastern Orthodox saying that we do use different words, but we mean the same thing. Uh, and the 30 years of study, detailed study, which I, I have behind me, uh, looking into these things, I am utterly and completely convinced uh, that the Eastern Orthodox Church and the Oriental Orthodox Church, our churches, have the same faith about Christ. And much of my activity throughout my life has been spent trying to uh, understand and help people uh, understand better uh, what we all believe. Uh, I pray that uh, at some time in my lifetime, uh, our Eastern Orthodox and Oriental Orthodox uh, Christians and bishops and priests will be able to come together and properly celebrate uh, our faith in Christ together. Uh, in our Orthodox Church, we pray long but beautiful prayers. Sometimes I can't help wondering if the verse that says something like, for a pretense they make long prayers, etc., could that be us? No, it's not. Um, also, Protestants especially will apply that same passage uh, where it speaks about vain repetition. And they will say that we should not pray, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, because it is a vain repetition. 
uh, in actual fact, that passage had in mind the practice of certain Pharisees at the time. And the, the translation vain repetition is a wrong one. Uh, it has rather a reference. It's a word that's not used often in the Greek. It refers to a poet in the Greek times who wrote very, very long rambling poems that were almost incomprehensible. And so he became a byword for for uh, language and speech that was long and rambling and never got to the point. Uh, and some of the Pharisees were like this because not only would they pray very long prayers, but they were determined to pray them in front of every everybody in the streets so that people would say, look how wonderful uh, this man is. Uh, he's standing in the street corner and he's praying for an hour. That's not why we pray lengthy prayers. We're not there looking at one another. We're not trying to show off. Uh, we are trying to express in human language how we feel about God. We are trying to express in human language and in hymns and prayers what we have learned about God. And what we have learned and what we want to say requires us both to use many words on some occasions and few words on other occasions. Uh, and so the difference is we are not standing on the street corners to be seen by people. The priest isn't praying long prayers just so that someone thinks how wonderful he is. Uh, the priest is leading the whole congregation in offering our common prayers to God. And we can hardly say enough about how wonderful God is. When we pray the commemoration of the saints uh, in Tasbihar, I think that's one of the most important parts of Tasbihar, uh, and often we rush through it. Uh, I like us to pray it at the right speed so that we can properly ask all of these saints to pray for us. Uh, and when we have finished asking all of these saints to pray for us, if we really understand what we're doing, then we would ask even more saints to pray for us. Uh, instead of rushing through them, instead of saying, can't we just ask a few saints to pray for us? If we really understood how much need we were in, uh, we would stand there even longer, asking even more saints to have mercy on us and pray for us. And so it is in our, our prayers and praises. Many of our, hy our hymns and prayers are, are straight from the Psalms. And unless we are going to say that the Psalmist David uh, was praying too long, then it doesn't seem to me to be wrong that we should pray the Psalms of St. David. Uh, many of them are quite long and, and we sing them in, in Tasbihar. Uh, but we cannot exhaust what we want to say about God. And we are not praying in the way that you describe to draw attention to ourselves. Hopefully all of our attention is on God, uh, who we are trying to praise to pray to and praise in the words we're using. Um, how should we read the Bible and should we start with the New or Old Testament? Uh, I think that there are two things that we can do. Uh, firstly, we can have a practice of reading through the whole Bible. That's a very good practice to have. Uh, and there are many different uh, reading programs that we could follow just by Googling uh, to give us an idea of how we could read several chapters a day uh, to read the whole Bible in one or two or three years. Uh, that's something that we can usefully do. It gives us a whole view of the Bible. But I am very convinced that especially if we are beginning, we should read the four Gospels over and over again. Uh, and I encourage many of those in my care to read a chapter or, or at least half a chapter uh, of a Gospel every day. And in the way that I was speaking about in my talk, to read it carefully and slowly and prayerfully and ask that God will bring some of it alive so that it's not just us learning about what's written in the Bible, but so that we're actually hearing God speak to us by bringing something alive in one way or another. So however you read the Bible, I would say that especially if we are beginners and I'm a beginner, we should read the Gospels over and over and over again. Uh, and there are 90 chapters in the Gospel so it would be easy to read half a chapter a day and read the Gospels in half a year or read a Gospel a day and read it in three months. But I think we should keep going back and back and back so that we are hearing 
uh, the words of Jesus himself, our Lord, God and Savior, Jesus Christ. And we are allowing them to become uh, part of our own life as we remember them more and more. So if you don't normally read the Bible, uh, maybe have a plan to read the whole Bible in a couple of years. But start with reading the Gospels at least half a chapter a day. And really, there's no reason why we can't read a whole chapter every day prayerfully and asking God to speak to us. Uh, the passage in Isaiah 53, I won't go into it in great detail. There's there's a blog on my website which addresses that. Uh, we have to be careful when we read the Old Testament that we are reading the Orthodox Old Testament. Uh, the Orthodox Old Testament is the Greek translation of the ancient Hebrew text, which was used by our Lord Jesus, was used by the apostles and was used by the church and is still used by the church. Uh, this was a translation from the Hebrew into the Greek in the years, the centuries before the time of our Lord Jesus. And it was especially um, undertaken uh, with the Jewish community in Alexandria in Egypt and with some of the Jewish communities in Palestine. And we find that there are differences in many of the books of the Bible. And even there are missing books in, in the later version. Uh, there are differences in especially Isaiah between this Septuagint Greek version, which was used by Jesus, and the version which we find in our English Protestant Bibles. Uh, we have to be aware of that. And in Isaiah 53, in the Protestant Bible, it does make it sound as though God the Father has punished the Son. But if we read the Septuagint, the Greek, the ancient version of Isaiah, which was used by our Lord Jesus and the apostles, we find that it doesn't say that at all. And uh, I, I have done a blog about that on my website. You may want to look at uh, at the moment. I am enjoying using and you can find it on on Amazon to buy uh, the Lexham uh, Septuagint, the Lexham Greek Old Testament in English. It's a new translation of the Old Testament that Jesus and the apostles used. And, and I recommend that to people. Um, I think we're finishing at seven. I'll look at a few more questions. Uh, the veneration of icons is not really an innovation or development. I, I don't believe that at all. Uh, we have we have certain traditions which perhaps push the use of uh, icons on a board very far back. There is a tradition that St. Luke, the evangelist, was an artist and he painted uh, images of the Virgin Mary and of Christ. What I would say is that the earliest church building we know in the world um, is found in uh, a Syrian ruined city called uh, Jura Europus. Um, and when it was being attacked by the Persian Empire in about 267, I believe, uh, the leaders of the city decided to uh, form a great earth rampart all the way around the city. And what they did is they buried all of the houses on the edge of the city. And one of those houses was a synagogue and one of those houses was a church, the earliest proper church building uh, that we have in existence. And when archaeologists cleared away all of the earth, uh, they were able to find these two buildings. And inside the synagogue, in their meeting room, all of the walls are covered with icons, Old Testament icons, of course. But they are all covered with pictures of stories from the Bible, the prophets, Moses. Um, in the church next door, we also see that all of the walls are covered with a similar decoration, including uh, icons of our Lord Jesus and, and the apostles and some of the stories from the gospel. In actual fact, the artwork in the synagogue is of a higher quality than in the church, which suggests that the church was, was poorer at the time than the synagogue. But both of these buildings were absolutely covered in iconography. And it would be very hard to imagine that this was the very first church in the whole world anywhere that had icons on the walls. Uh, it would be very, very unusual to imagine that we found archaeologically wise the very first church that ever had icons. Uh, and also, it's not a very large city. It's a small city. So we can imagine that much, much earlier, as soon as people were converting their houses into dedicated church buildings, 
uh, they were starting to decorate the walls just as some of the synagogues clearly were also decorated. And if you go into the catacombs, uh, the tombs underneath Rome, where earliest Christians were buried, we see their icons on many of the places where people are buried. And during times of persecution, it was in these underground tunnels and caves that Christians would worship. And they would have been surrounded by icons. So they may not have been of the same style as we have now. There has been a change of style. Uh, they may not have been held in position in the same way because the development of the icon screen also comes about in history. But we can say that very, very early on, as soon as we start to see proper church buildings, uh, converted houses that were used for the church, we also start to see decoration in this way. And so I don't believe that our veneration of icons is very late and an innovation. I believe that it's an essential part of our orthodox understanding. Um, it tells us that because we can have a picture of Jesus, Jesus really became a man. He wasn't just a ghost. He wasn't just God pretending to be there. Because he was really a man, we can really draw a picture of him. Uh, we don't suggest even that it looks exactly like him, but it represents him to us. And all of these stories that we have in the other icons, all of the other uh, saints that are represented, um, these also remind us of the reality that these things actually took place. And they remind us when we are standing in church that we are surrounded uh, by the presence of these heavenly figures. Uh, and even in our houses where we're gathered, if we have icons with us, they remind us that we are not alone. And many times I sometimes prayed in my church on my own or began the services in my, on my own. I know that I'm not alone in my church. I'm not alone here in my house, uh, apart from my family. Uh, you are not alone in your house. Uh, and the icons remind us of this and bring this community that we belong to, to be present with us wherever we find ourselves. Uh, thank you very much for, for bearing with me through the length of this uh, reflection. I hope that one or two words were helpful to you all, and uh, I imagine that this will be recorded. Uh, I, I don't think I can take any more questions. I was told it was a half hour question time. Uh, but may God bless you all. May the love of God the Father, the grace of his only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, and the communion and gift of the Holy Spirit be with you all, with all those you love, all those you work with, especially at this time of great anxiety, and be with you all now and ever and unto the ages of ages. Amen.